Hi, I'm Steve Balch, director of the Texas Tech Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to another of our Institute Encounters in which we have conversations with uh, visiting faculty who come to Texas Tech, in this case uh, under the auspices of the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholars Program. I wear another hat. I'm president of the uh, Lambda of Texas chapter of Phi Beta Kappa here at Texas Tech, and we've been honored this year uh, to have, actually it's three years in a row now, so we've been especially honored uh, to have a, a visiting scholar of real distinction uh, come to our university. And uh, this year's visiting scholar, who will now interview, is uh, Dr. Jamshid Choksi, who is a distinguished professor and chairman of the Department of Central Eurasian Studies at Indiana University. He's also a member of the National Endowment for the Humanities National Council, uh, which is a great honor, a presidential appointment, and Senate confirmation, uh, and the author of uh, any number of books on uh, Iranian uh, society and politics, on Zoroastrianism uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, and he himself is uh, a member of the Zoro Zoroastrian community in the United States. Uh, Zoroastrianism has long interested me uh, because while it's not in the contemporary world a, a very large religion, uh, it is historically an enormously influential one that has shaped uh, the many of the great world religions of today, particularly uh, Christianity and Islam, and has influenced them primarily through Judaism. So, three of the uh, important religions in the world uh, have been shaped in critical ways by Zoroastrianism, which makes it, despite its small size, an important religion in the world. So let's find out more about this faith, which uh, I would think not many Americans uh, know much about, if anything. Uh, it's named after someone uh, who was uh, Zoroaster or Zarathustra, as yes. he's sometimes called. Zoroaster for the Greeks, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the original Iranian Zarathustra, uh, a religious preacher, singer of religious hymns, uh, who lived in Central Asia, uh, approximately 1500 to 1800 BCE, uh, in, so back in the Bronze Age. So he's a rough contemporary of, of Abraham. Of Abraham, approximately different uh, locations. Essentially, I would say, at the opposite ends of the then known world, mm -hmm. uh, but both extremely influential, uh, setting into motion a series of thoughts and communities that endure to the present. So what do we know about his life and uh, what he accomplished? Yeah. So what we know about Zarathustra, what we can put together from... Uh, the oral traditions he left behind that were eventually uh, codified uh, from the archaeology of the period is that he was part of a settled society. Uh, this was a, a, a small urban settlements scattered throughout Central Asia connected by trade uh, and uh, these were farmers and a herdsman. But it was a society in transition. He himself talks about the fact that the settlements are increasingly being raided by nomads and it is that social uh, flux that seems to trigger uh, his revelations. It's interesting that when we look sort of at the history of religions, it's these points of social change that very often uh, trigger in individuals. We know this for the Prophet Muhammad as well, that this is a period where in the case of, uh, of the Hijaz, the Arabian Sea area of Arabia, uh, that the trading, mercantile trade was declining. And so that society was in flux. For Zarathustra's time, uh, the settlements were gradually being overrun, uh, disintegrating uh, under the influx of nomads. And so, essentially... Uh, are these the Indo-European invaders they, who will eventually move into India? These, uh, these are part... They, they, they were all... These were, these were all Indo-Iranian groups, mm -hmm. just subgroups among them. Some of them more nomadic, uh, worshipping, uh, shall we say, more martial divinities. Mm -hmm. And Zarathustra, uh, in, in reality, where, where his hymns begin, uh, with, he be, begins with a question. He is essentially wanting to know, you know, what will happen? Uh, he says, you know, what will happen? Where shall I go? Where shall I flee from here? You know, to which place shall I go? Because this place is disintegrating. And so those revelations sort of begin from those basic questions. 
Uh, and, and then from there he gradually develops a notion of good and evil, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, the notion that the divinity is all good, that evil comes from a separate source, that uh, humans have to make a choice, that we are created by the divinity, but we have free will. And that is how he explains what's happening in his society, that he, he conceives the society as created by, uh, by God, uh, humans, animals, plants, the landscape, everything. Uh, but he sees people as making poor choices. He sees those choices as essentially originating from evil. The term he uses is drug. It's actually a direct cognate with the English drug, with words like dregs, etc. So the bad, dark stuff. Mm -hmm. what is, essentially, he sees it as people being confused uh, by evil and therefore choosing to do evil. So what he talks about is what comes, what the consequences of what happened there to his society, but also then ultimately this lays the foundations for our ideas of a conflict between good and evil, between God and the devil. So one of the deep issues in um, modern religion yeah. is the problem of evil. evil. And in the monotheistic religions, it's an especial challenge because uh, if there is only one supreme deity and he is good, yep. Uh, where does evil come from? Right. Uh, why doesn't he just get rid of it? So Zoroastrianism had, uh, prior to the development of monotheism, a rather interesting answer to this. Answer to this, yes. Oh, what so, is that? So the way so Zarathustra de dealt with that same question, uh, and, and yes, how does a good god uh, deal with evil, and why does a good do god permit evil to occur? So Zarathustra's revolution, uh, re resolution to that was to see the divinity as omniscient, all-knowing, but not omnipotent. To see evil as if being a completely separate locus. So being uh, eternal together with good. The, so the devil, in a sense, the angry spirit, as he referred to him, uh, as opposed to the good benevolent spirit, the angry spirit being coexistent, uh, having chosen pro uh, improperly, wrongly, uh, so his explanation, as opposed to monotheism, I mean, in other words, he absorbs the divinity of any link to evil, but in doing so, of course, the divinity is therefore is not omnipotent right away. The divinity, however, is omniscient, which, of course, ultimately sways. So what you end up with is, is a combat mythology mm -hmm. in which God may not be all-powerful, but since God is all-knowing, God knows past, present, and future. So in a sense, God can plot the way to the, to the end, uh, are playing the way to the end, whereas we're told the devil only knows the past and the present, not the future. Was that a result of his bad choice? Bad choice, yes. In other words, he's confused. Mm -hmm. He cannot see clearly. So if he saw clearly, he'd realize that at the end, his struggles would be futile. So it's not as if God is more powerful than the devil, the bad spirit. Yeah. Rather, he will outwit him yes. because uh, he has more foresight. He has more foresight, and he has chosen to uh, to outwit him correctly, appropriately, uh, and not destructively. And they're considered to be siblings, aren't they? They, they essentially are twin spirits, yes, mm -hmm. twin spirits. So that that is the resolution <laughs> that helps Zarathustra get around the problems that we then later encounter with, shall we say, Yahweh, uh, uh, or the Lord God and ultimately Allah. Uh, the Muslim resolution, of course, is that God choose as the the free, essentially the ultimate free will to do as God wishes, and in a sense is unknowable. Uh, but certainly in Judaism, you see that tension uh, present. So the solution in Christianity is that it's man's fault. Yes, that it's humans who have chosen Chose badly. They've badly. been tempted by the tempter, but he's a derivative spirit. Spirit, yes. Uh, they fall prey to his wiles uh, and then uh, fall out of God's favor in a way and have to live Correct. under circumstances of punishment. So Christianity yes, is certainly picking up this notion of free will, that there is a choice and, and uh, both the first humans and uh, everyone now uh, has those choices. Uh, the uh, the Christian notion of a fall, uh, ultimately going, shall we say, all the way back to, uh, shall we, the Sumerians and the Babylonians, this notion of of, of uh, Eden, uh, of, uh, of a primordial couple uh, that ends up in the Bible, uh, uh, then you know, is is one attempt to answer that question. That is, so uh, you know, it's uh, God uh, gives commandments. 
uh, uh, humans choose not to follow those commandments. So this notion of disobedience, in a sense, and uh, and that certainly is going to impact Zoroastrianism as well. And it's easy to see the impact because uh, you know the uh, in Zoroastrianism people have free will, but the expectation is that you will do good, and that if you choose to do better, uh, choose poorly, then in a sense you are disobeying the divinity. So you have free will, but you don't have a fallen nature, as in Christianity. Uh, you you have free will. You don't have uh, you don't have primordial sin uh, that continues generation to generation. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoroastrianism does ultimately assimilate the notion that there is a primordial fall through again disobedience uh, to the divinity. In this case, the primordial couple which said chooses to hedge their bets. They worship God and they figure, well, mm -hmm. you know, no, let's worship the devil as well. Mm -hmm. And but. Uh, the choice is afresh for each person. Now that that you're su you're kind of suggesting that comes into Zoroastrianism that, later. Yes, that's coming in later. That's coming in later uh, uh, because the original Zoroastrian creation story has God creating the world completely perfect, pure, has an and androgynous uh, hominid mm. and a cow and a. Uh, uh, and uh, a plant, and we're told that the evil spirit finds this so attractive and wants to possess it mm. and attacks it. And the only way evil can hold on to anything is by polluting it, killing it. So we're told mm. that the evil spirit then kills of all life, but God quickly steps in and then makes sure that life continues from, from the dying uh, creatures. We were having this very interesting conversation about uh, this uh, attempts uh, of uh, the, the issue of evil and uh, 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 attempts to rationalize and uh, explain evil within the context of divinities and the whole issue of where that puts uh, divinities. I've often sort of seen monotheism as a spectrum uh, where maybe Islam is, shall we say, uh, the most absolute uh, and Christianity sort of in between, Judaism sort of more fluid, and then Zoroastrianism finding uh, the other extreme of separating uh, good and evil uh, completely. You think Judaism is more fluid? I would have thought that Judaism was, at least once it gelled, uh, rather austerely monothe monotheistic. Yeah, in the way it will, yeah, in, mm -hmm. in the way in which it eventually gelled, but looking in, in terms of, shall we say, the history of religions, mm -hmm. when Islam uh, uh, arrives, in a sense, its ideas are already very fully fledged. Christianity, uh, the ideas crystallize very quickly. With Judaism, it's a very more progressive development of the development of the of Yahweh to become the sole divinity of Israel. Uh, and uh, in a sense, we also see this parallels of development where Aura Mazda becomes more and more powerful, shall we say, historically speaking, uh, as the religion uh, uh, develops and interacts with Judaism. So uh, another thing that you get uh, from Zoroastrianism, as I understand it, and I, I think this is probably a uh, innovation, it's kind of altogether new in human thought, is the notion of the history of the world, uh, these kind of um, holy, sacred history of the world, yeah. and hence the history of the world at the mundane level too. Uh, being a linear progression, linear progression towards something, yeah. right. so maybe you could explain. So yeah, that. so I mean, if one thinks about so these, the you know, uh, uh, sort of earlier notions, if you look at the Syrians and Babylonians, uh, yes, there is an afterlife, but it's it often duplicates uh, the life on Earth. The rulers are still rulers in the afterlife, etc. Uh, uh, certainly uh, in Pharaonic Egypt, uh, you know, among the rulers of Syria, Babylonia. Uh, even with the Greeks, uh, 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 quite a bit of this. Uh, what, what Zarathustra really sort of is part of this sort of scheme he comes up with, uh, there's a linear progression. It's a one-shot deal. There is no reincarnation, no rebirth. Uh, social hierarchies don't continue in the afterlife because there's the social free will. So everyone can do good, everyone can do evil. Uh, and so the outcome for individuals or for within the system for the spirit after the death, death of the body, uh, uh, the notion of individual judgment, heaven, hell, uh, or an intermediate limbo kind of place, uh, 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 is based on individual choices. So everyone has its its uh, 
uh, you don't have the option of a redo in another uh, life. Uh, uh, you know, because time itself is seen as linear, uh, there's a point where you know the, the, the two spirits have chosen one to do good, one to do evil. Time is in, so, and then that choice results in the conflict beginning at the spiritual level. And it's also yep. an egalitarian yes. notion of yep. the afterlife. Right, exactly. Which all social distinctions exactly. are leveled. Exactly, are leveled completely. And, so and just that makes it a kind of universal yeah. religion in which all men are brothers in some deep and, sense. And in, in a real yeah. sense, because, yes, this older notion that a king is still a king in the afterlife is gone. Uh, a king can enjoy a wonderful afterlife till the end of time if he or she has done good. Uh, uh, the same for uh, the, the poorest of the poor. Uh, in other words, uh, there's also the notion that to, uh, for those who much is given, much is expected for them. And uh, so... So what, what, what is the idea then of the responsibilities of kingship in this life? Right. So the responsibilities of kingship in this life, ideally, are to be ensure social stability, well-being. So there is the notion that develops uh, from this, that and we see this then later on, even in Christianity. If you look at uh, Byzantine icons, you see the hand of Jesus reaching down from heaven to touch the monarch, essentially to, uh, the notion that the kings are chosen by the divinity. So there is this notion that kings are responsible to ensure that their kingdoms are safe, that their people are taken care of, and that they're held responsible, that, uh, uh, that tyrants will May, may enjoy uh, mortal pleasures, but there is very clear the notion that they will reap as they have sowed, mm -hmm. and that if they have dispensed pain and suffering, then they will uh, receive pain and suffering, not from the divinity as punishment, but because they have chosen to do evil things, therefore they have chosen to ally themselves with the devil, and there's a notion that the devil is a harsh creature, and therefore the only way the devil treats people is harshly. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, there's also a sense of uh, an ultimate showdown. Isn't there a kind of Armageddon? Uh, uh, there wouldn't uh, be yes. Armageddon in uh, Zoroastrianism. No, yes, right, right. But yes. Uh, apocalyptic right. showdown. Yeah, well, yes, of course, the term Armageddon comes very mm -hmm. directly from uh, uh, Israelite history. Uh, uh, and uh, But yes, there is the notion of the ultimate showdown, uh, the notion that, uh, that uh, since this is a linear progression, that as hu more and more humans work with the divinity that gradually evil is pushed back and back until it n is no longer manifest at so all. So it's a common effort. Yes. Uh, say the more right. good humans you have, right. the quicker this final uh, defeat of evil will Technically, come. Technically, yes, yes. I mean that... We're that, allies yeah. of the divinity. Exactly. In other words, we are, so uh, what this also in a sense does is to say that that in, a, in a very real sense, the divinity needs humans as well. Mm -hmm. We're not just creatures of, and creations of the divinity, but but we are, in a sense, special. Uh, and you can see this reflection also uh, in 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 the in Tanakh and the Bible, you know, and and the Christian Bible as well. That uh, that that humans have this special relationship uh, as uh, creatures of God, and therefore the expectations are high as well. And, and so this notion that yet at the end of time, uh, that since it is a good divinity, that ultimately even those who have fallen along the way are forgiven uh, because it is understood so that... No one, no one is eternally damned. No, this is the interesting thing. No one is eternally damned. One suffers for whatever that period of time is after death. Uh, but that at the end, everyone is resurrected. So this notion that the earth is refreshed of heaven on earth that eventually becomes so important, not just in medieval Christianity, but particularly in contemporary evangelical Christianity, uh, that uh, stems from this notion that at the end of it all, that God will be kind and merciful, and that God wants nothing but the best, and therefore God will refresh the earth, and all humans will be resurrected, pain, suffering will be gone, so social distinctions will be gone. In others, they will be unnecessary, uh, and evil will be no longer manifest. So, I mean, and one of the ways in which you do good is, I assume, by worshipping Ahura Mazda, yeah, that's, being, yes. being a Zoroastrian, right. Right. essentially. Right. 
So other religions that feel this way, like, like uh, Christianity and Islam, make very active efforts to convert right. those who are not already within right. the faith, yeah. because it's they're not living rightly. They're by, not living really rightly. And so is that true for Zoroastrianism? Zoroastrianism, clearly, Zoroastrianism, particularly in ancient times, with the Persian Empire, was very widely spread. Then with the Sasanians, etc., until the coming of Islam, was I will say one of two predominant religions in the Middle East uh, area, uh, Christianity being the other. Uh, initially, you know, Judaism and uh, Zoroastrianism, then Christianity and Zoroastrianism. Uh, the uh, but but yes, uh, much like Judaism, it was uh, 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 until modern times with Judaism and with uh, Zoroastrianism. Until modern times, it was not a proselytizing religion. That's a little odd. Yeah. After all, yeah. Judaism, in the first place, didn't until relatively late right. have a vivid conception of the afterlife. Right. So being a Jew was not a passport to eternal salvation. Yeah, of course, that and comes from Zoroastrianism into Judaism. But yes, yeah, so and, it, and yeah. secondly, it, I, I don't think uh, it regarded Gentiles, non-Jews, yes. uh, as being um, uh, headed for some terrible fate in the afterlife. Right, yeah. I mean, they could be good in their own right, way, exactly. and that would be good enough. And 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 the Zoroastrianism also did retain have, have some aspects of that. That is. There was the notion that they were people of other religions, that that while Zo from the Zoroastrian viewpoint that that was not the preferable option, so long as they also did good, they were also seen as assisting uh, the our us, our Mazda, the wise Lord. And, and so you'd and, end up on the right side. And so you'd end up on the right side. Mm -hmm. Plus the notion that the divinity being all good understands that part of the nature of choosing poorly is that mm -hmm. from the Zoroastrian perspective one may have been born into or decided to be a member of another religion one may have done good there may not have but that at the end all will be in a sense forgiven mm -hmm. that uh, that since the that, that that since the divinity created all humans equal and conceived of all humans as all good that yes, some have fallen along the so, way. So the imperative to yes. convert other people is not quite is strong. It's not quite strong. The mm -hmm. imperative is not uh, is not strong because it is not like the notion that the only people who are going to be there at the final end to receive the final benefits have to have been Zoroastrians all and, the way and, through. And we don't have, during the time that it was the official religion of Persia, um, we don't have any evidence of the Persian kings carrying out religious wars. This is the interesting thing. You don't have, the only time you have the Persian kings attempting religious uh, intervention is for individuals they see as having moved away from Zoroastrianism. So a good example is when the Sasanians, Armenia was a vassal state to the Sasanian Empire. Arme the Armenians were Zoroastrians. Uh, the conversion of Armenia uh, by uh, Gregory the Illuminator uh, occurs among the Ar Armenian nobles and the Sasanians first try treaties to have the Armenian nobles convert back. When that fails, then the Sasanians do launch military actions, very uh, drastic actions, which of course don't succeed, but, but that's because they saw them as having stepped outside the faith. Uh, there was never attempts to convert the Jewish population. There were never attempts, in fact, well, from the Jewish population to convert the Zoroastrian population. Uh, that, that, in a sense, missionizing religions mm -hmm. really, really spring uh, uh, in in an Asian context with Buddhism, uh, 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 in a Middle Eastern context with Christianity, uh, then a far lesser known religion called Manichaeism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so th that's the, yeah. So, and uh, then there's Islam, of course. So in, the, in the last great Roman-Persian war, yeah. when the Persians capture Jerusalem, they carry off the true cross, but what do they do with it? They give it to their own Christians. Well, see, this, right. yeah, <laughs> you see, this is the very interesting thing. So if you talk about the last Persian invasion under Husro II uh, uh, into Jerusalem, it's one of these very interesting things. So you have Jewish communities in, in the Roman Byzantine Empire who are persecuted. You have Jewish communities in the Parthian Sasanian Empire who have official status, state protection, and so in a sense the Jewish communities in Jerusalem, etc., 
counterpart counterparts in this Iranian world mm -hmm. to help support them. So when Husro's troops come in, in fact, they're welcomed into Jerusalem. Of course, eventually the Iranians get pushed back out. The, the Byzantines come in and, and uh, uh, severely persecute right. the Jews. But yes, so when, when Husro takes back parts of the True Cross, etc., uh, yes, they're, uh, they're good. So one of uh, Husro's favorite queen was actually a Nestorian mm -hmm. Christian. So parts of these Christian relics are given, put, placed in her chapel. The others are given to the Nestorian communities in Iran. And very interesting, when the Byzantines counter-strike and Heraclius comes down through the Black Sea in Armenia and cuts off the Iranian capital from the east, one of the uh, uh, terms of Byzantine terms of withdrawal is that the Iranians find all the relics they've taken and return them to the Christians in Jerusalem. Yes. So, yes. So, so, the true course was in pieces. But, well, uh, well uh, <laughs> many, many, many pieces. Many pieces. Uh, this is the issue of relics. It's sort of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it's interesting that Christianity in particular uh, has this notion of, of relics associated mm -hmm. with the religious founder. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't really see that uh, as individual aspects in Judaism, you don't see that in Zoroastrianism. You do see it in Buddhism, where the very the physical uh, the skeleton of the Buddha is uh, uh, is taken apart and little pieces sent across the Buddhist world. There are there are burial places for um, Islamic saints for Islamic Shia saints for saints. But Shia saints because Shiism picks up Shiism as it develops as an offshoot of mainstream Islam as the Sunni Islam. Uh, is very much influenced by Christianity. By so Mary's image for, comes on uh, the image of Fatima, the Prophet Muhammad's daughter, who uh, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, the so that model continues the notion of essentially a bloodline uh, that you see in Christianity. And, and relics coming and as relics well. uh, that mm -hmm. all goes into Shiism, not into mm -hmm. Sunni Islam. But, but not. They're also preoccupied with martyrdom in Shiism, which, which also is a Christian, yeah. Yeah. with a Christian influence into Shiism, which which essentially does not, uh, has has very little occurrence, uh, you know, in in the relationship between the Jewish and the Western communities, or in this uh, all the way from the Persian Empire through uh, the Islamic conquests, uh, you don't see this. This uh, those ideas are coming up very much. Uh, uh, shall we say, uh, 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 into Christianity and, and beginning, of course, with the Roman persecutions of the Jewish community. So uh, there have been a lot of transfers of ideas yes. among all of right. these religions. Um, where do the Western religions, Judaism and Christianity, at, at what point in history do they begin to absorb Zoroastrian ideas? The main contact point seems to be occurring when the Israelites uh, are enslaved by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, there they start having mercantile contacts and uh, and other contacts with the uh, uh, with the Persians and the Medes. And we uh, we know this from the biblical text. We know this also from the Assyrian, Babylonian documents, Persian documents. And then you have the Median kingdom that ousts the, that takes over the Assyrians. So the the so-called lost tribes. Uh, that was supposedly resettled in the Zagros and all, uh, now part of the Median Kingdom. Then, of course, Cyrus and the Persians conquer Babylonia, the end of the Jewish exile. And so that's the period where you really have this influx of ideas. Uh, you know, uh, so individuals like Daniel and the Book of Daniel, with its various different levels, part, some of them uh, from the exile, some of them post exilic, and, you know, Isaiah, so pseudo Isaiah, second Isaiah. Uh, Ezra and these books, uh, Nehemiah and all, uh, many of these individuals are actually officials of the Persian court, represent uh, uh, Jewish members, official representatives from the Persian court to uh, to uh, uh, to the Jewish uh, the early Jewish community, and and so that's the period where we really see these ideas coming together. So the biblical book of Leviticus uh, and part of the Zoroastrian scriptures, part of the Avesta. That's the term, overall term. There's a sub uh, a text called the Vidyavdat. It, it literally means uh, the code against the demons. So the Leviticus purity codes, uh, the, uh, the, the Zoroastrian purity codes, these are developing, reinforcing each other. At the same time, uh, the issues of menstruation, uh, the issues of uncleanness, childbirth, we see all that stuff of, of ritual purification, mikwa, 
uh, on the Jewish side, uh, uh, it's very interesting that the uh, that, that biblical texts refer to uh, these uh, 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 Jewish officials from the Persian court inaugurating the mikvah in Jerusalem, uh, and uh, uh, so yeah, so that's that period where these ideas are really coming together, and and then they're going to continue, uh, you know, reinforcing each other uh, all the way. Uh, uh, over until the advent of Christianity, and then you end up having sort of these non-proselytizing religions uh, encountering Christianity and rea and interacting and reacting to Christianity. And we see this very much, you know, in the Byzantine Sasanian Wars, uh, where it is always from the Jewish community side preferable to be on the Iranian side of the border than on on the Byzantine side of the border. And uh, and the very interesting thing when we look at some of the more more ordinary documents, uh, it's that there were understandings between these communities uh, of not missionizing, not proselytizing. So uh, you know, uh, let us say you moved from the Jewish, com Jewish community and became a Zoroastrian. Then the Zoroastrian magus would essentially take you back to your rabbi and say, look, this guy, Stephen, is your problem, not us, please settle it. And if I came over, mm -hmm. then you would lead me back to Omegas and say, look, you know, that's the way communal identity and also mm -hmm. peace, a tranquility between the religions was maintained. That, that word has, as we know, changed very greatly. Uh, and, uh, and so we see much of, sort of, shall we say, the religious clashes. What was the influence of Judaism and maybe later Christianity on Zoroastrianism? On Zoroastrianism. So one was certainly we see, you know, in the post-exilic period, the, the, the strengthening of Aura Mazda uh, as sort of as, as far more powerful absolute divinity, far more in control of this linear scheme of time. And that is clearly coming from the strengthening of Yahweh as the absolute soul god of Israel. Uh, so that that is there very strongly. Uh, the with Christianity, uh, or the, the, shall we say, the main influence you begin to see is you begin to see tinges. It's never fully developed, but tinges of notions of saints entering uh, Zoroastrianism. Mm -hmm. It never really takes hold. Uh, uh, it certainly is far more influential into uh, yeah, into Islam. Particularly Shia Islam. Which, which, on which side does the notion of Messiah develop? Okay, so Zoroastrianism, Zarathustra already was talking about that uh, that things have to go all the way to be really, really bad. Uh, 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 but while it's bad because uh, evil is, shall we say, at its peak, but humans are also fighting back really hard, and that's the notion where supposedly a Messiah develops who is a long, long descendant of Zarathustra, uh, who is going to, he's called the Saoshant, essentially means the savior, uh, 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 who is going to uh, lead the final charge against evil. Uh, of course, that, that idea then develops and gets fleshed out, and you end up having a series of saviors, and that is very largely under the influence of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So after the Muslim conquest, uh, Zoroastrianism is no longer a state religion. Uh, it's replaced by Islam. Yeah. Uh, and what happens to the Zoroastrian community under those right. conditions? So it's interesting. You have this uh, Arab conquest of the Middle East uh, uh, starting in the, in the uh, early 630s. Uh, um, the Arabs have reached Central Asia by uh, the early 700s. Uh, and have spread across North Africa. Uh, the uh, uh, the Sasanian Empire's capital, Tessiphon, is where Baghdad now is. So it was re easy reach. Uh, and uh, however, Constantinople was much further away. So the Byzantine Empire would survive, minus Egypt, of course, which was its breadbasket in a very real sense. Uh, the Sasanian Empire would not. And but of course, through across the Middle East, what we begin to see is first in urban centers because that's where the Arabs first settle, and then eventually spreading to the countryside. This gradual spread of Islam, uh, 
uh, it's a very slow process that we can track now through genealogy, name changes. One of the good things is that when a family, whether it was a Jewish family, a Zoroastrian family, a Christian family, and the pattern is pretty same whether it's Egypt uh, or Central Asia or Syria, wherever, uh, the first convert to Islam takes a very traditional Muslim name, Muhammad, Ali, mm -hmm. uh, and then they continue to name children and grandchildren for a few generations, and then they go back to their the regional names. Uh, so th that's the sort of a genealogical blip where you can mm -hmm. track conversion. Mm -hmm. So you can throw that into a statistical okay. curve, mm -hmm. and that what tells us about 900, 950s when the major cities of the Middle East uh, have become Muslim, and uh, then by about 1300, the countryside is predominantly Muslim. So in that transition, of course, Christianity survives in Europe. Uh, Judaism survives as small communities in the Middle East, and then, of course, uh, in the, di the European diasporas. Uh, Zoroastrianism also ends up surviving largely in diasporas. A community moves into uh, uh, the Western China, eventually Confucianized, assimilated. Others end up on the Indian subcontinent, uh, going to the Indian subcontinent, like going to China, was not surprising. They had long mercantile contacts. We know that before the advent of Islam, these, the overland and maritime routes took Zoroastrian Jews and Christians mm -hmm. to the Indian subcontinent. We have Christian communities, Christian Nestorian crosses, Jewish communities there, and also Zoroastrian communities. So within the Indian religious system, because you had so many different religious communities, each community, again, it was sort of very much like the Middle Eastern model, where communities were expected not to proselytize, to stay within their own confines, Zoroastrianism survived. The group is called the Parsis, means Persians. Others survived smaller numbers in Iran, and then from uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and from Iran, eventually, smaller community, diaspora communities, even in the United States, about 10,000 now, mainly in all the large cities of North America. Uh, you know, from New York to San Francisco to Los Angeles to Houston, uh, Dallas, uh, uh, Toronto, Montreal, Chicago, uh, small uh, Zoroastrian communities. They have uh, temples. They're called fire temples because, like the cross, is an icon for prayer in Christianity, or the Qibla direction to Mecca. Uh, uh, you have, uh, or you know, the notion that one faces Jerusalem. Uh, you know, the fire is the focal point as a creation of God, of light, of goodness. Does, um, I, I, I gather that though it's a small community, uh, the Parsis and, and even more lately the Zoroastrians in Persia are a, a high achieving community. Right. Um, that in India they're very middle class, in some cases quite wealthy. Um, what, is, is that because they became slotted into a kind of mercantile caste, so to speak, or is it because the ones who came from Persia were already traders and merchants? And well, as far as we can tell, a wide variety are coming from uh, from Iran, Persia, but there, you can certainly see parallels between, let's say, the Parsi community that ends up in India, and the Jewish diasporas, and also the Armenian community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where certainly one of the tickets to uh, to social acceptance is learning, so knowledge is one, trade is the other, and so uh, uh, you have these communities of, of knowledge and of, of mm -hmm. and of trade, and in fact what you end up seeing is that these communities then, for centuries later, continue to, to intertrade, to share knowledge, and essentially these are uh, mercantile communities that are also transmitting knowledge and spread very widely, uh, they spread, uh, uh, you know, across parts of uh, South Asia, parts of Southeast Asia, up into the Caucasus, uh, uh, even down the uh, African coastline. So communities that, uh, where again, knowledge is one ticket, so education becomes very important, and therefore uh, the achievements that spread, uh, that spring from uh, uh, that, together with uh, the achievements, the, the uh, shall we say, the wealth that comes from mercantile mm -hmm. activities, Plus this notion that one has to give back to the community or the country. So you end up seeing, again, within the Indian subcontinent, uh, individuals who range from uh, serving in the Indian military, field marshals and others, to the development of the Indian atomic uh, and eventually nuclear weapons program, 
Uh, from the great industrialists. Yes, in, and of course the very right. large industrialists. So the Tata Group of India mm -hmm. that now owns the, the Jaguar cars, mm -hmm. uh, the Jaguar Group, uh, is of Parsi background. Uh, uh, Zubin Mehta, the well-known composer. Yeah, uh, uh, yes. So, yes, so again this, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, this notion of, of knowledge, of learning, of the transmission of knowledge, and of religious knowledge and secular knowledge. Is there a field of study that looks at diaspora communities? There the actually country? is quite a bit of, of studies of this. Because it is very interesting there of the similarities, the differences, but also the interactions, because these diaspora continue, uh, communities also continue to interact with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the Iranian context, uh, even in modern Iran, uh, you will find uh, uh, the uh, Zoroastrian Fire Temple, uh, a synagogue, and a church often down the same street. And because there's also safety, security, and they tend to work together. So in contemporary Iran, the contemporary Islamic Republic, uh, the Islamic Republic regards the old Jewish community, the old Zoroastrian community, and the Armenian and Assyrian or Nestorian Christians as traditional religious groups. So they have protected minority status. So they have representatives in parliament. And they're relatively affluent. They're, they're affluent, but they also cooperate and work together, including their elected representatives in parliament. Mm -hmm. The minority communities often will work together and then decide how to uh, respond, let us say, to uh, an issue that has come up mm -hmm. in, in, in the state. So uh, there are a comparatively large number of um, Zoroastrians in the United States today. Uh, at 10,000, well, uh, comparatively, yes. The total yeah. number is what, about 100,000? About 100,000 or less, yes. So, yeah. 10, so 10, no, 10, the, United, the United States is the third largest community at this point. And at what point do they migrate to the United okay. States? Okay, so you have early, shall we say, my, the documents from places like Salem in New England indicate that that well, actually very well-known affluent Parsi uh, merchants uh, were already traveling to New England, really? to, 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 uh, to colonial New England. Uh, uh, and they're written about by, by some of the local authors who talk about these people coming and dining with them and how they dressed and... So and they, weren't, the, they weren't just seamen on ships? No, 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 no. And, and uh, I believe it's in the museum in Salem actually has one of, one of these uh, wealthy Parsis who came was actually asked to donate a set of clothing and all to the museum. Really? Uh, so that, you know, this is what, you know, you know wealthy Parsi from India wore uh, uh, at, at that time. Uh, yeah, there's another very interesting... Kind of the onboard ships from the East India Company? Yeah, well, exactly. Well, the Parsis very quickly became the builders of the ships mm -hmm. for the East India Company. So, if one thinks about the Star Spangled Banner, that was written on a British warship that was built in Bombay by Parsi, by a Parsi well, uh, shipbuilding mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, another interesting connection well, to the I'm United trying States. trying to remember Moby Dick, I believe, on the Pequod. Yes. There is a character who exactly. is a Parsi. Yeah, exactly. Um, he may well. be described as a devil worshiper. I'm not quite yeah. sure. But, but there's <laughs> a game. But so this maritime. <laughs> so very quickly, the... <coughs> the Parsis took over the shipbuilding industry mm -hmm. for the British. Mm -hmm. And so that became part of the British fleet, and therefore then uh, the, the connections, the trading connections, as you can see, flowing all the way to, uh, to, uh, to the so American coast. The Parsis have been with us throughout our entire history. Yeah. Through, throughout the entire that's modern what, history. That's what President Obama should have uh, said. He uh, should have said Parsis have, have been, been here part of long, American history for the beginning. Time. In fact, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, they have, and that's, that is When the did they first come to settle? Uh, well, so. Uh, the, the settlements, the settlements are beginning in the, from the 1920s onwards, uh, largely sp uh, spurred by uh, education, Western style education, first, uh, first to, uh, to Britain of course, uh, and then Western Europe, and then to the United States. But then the second, shall we say, large migration occurs, of course, with the Iranian Re Islamic Revolution in 1979. And that's the larger wave of Iranian mm -hmm. refugees mm -hmm. that have been coming to the United States. Uh, and among them Zoroastrians as well, and uh, and again very uh, ed again education mm -hmm. uh, because that was also the case in Iran education industrialism all the rest uh, and that has continued here and they settled in large cities and I guess so now there's now a second generation being and now there's here. second and third generations mm -hmm. uh, in the United States here at Texas Tech uh, te Texas Tech indeed yeah exactly I mean uh, my own son 
was born in Indianapolis, so you'd consider him a Hoosier, <laughs> uh, attended the University of Chicago, so up Midwest, and now he's in California. So, uh, that's, yeah. And um, what what is the nature of, of the religious life for um, Parsis for, living for, for in the United Parsis States? For Parsis and also Iranians or Astrians. So, religious life ultimately does, in a sense, get centered around mm -hmm. communal centers. So, the large cities have communal centers, and as part of the communal center, you'll also have uh, not a separate temple, but you'll have uh, an area which will have essentially uh, a central temple room with a, with a fire. Uh, you no longer in the United States have, by and large, you don't have full-time priests. Is it a large hearth or is it a small... Oh, no, no, it's, a, it's, it's an actual, it will be an actual uh, 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 metal uh, or fire, uh, fire altar mm -hmm. uh, with a pan on top uh, on which uh, a fire burns. Uh, usually in the United States, in, in they may not be perpetually burning as they were used to be in ancient Iran. There are a couple of uh, uh, ancient fires still left in Iran, and also fires that were uh, set up in India that are now centuries old. Uh, but yes, yeah, so you have communal life, you have the prayer services. Uh, many of the priests in the United States now, are, of course, dual uh, career priests as well as you know they could be a CPA or a chemist or. or a philosopher, yes. And um, uh, do, do the children remain faithful or do they uh, wander well, off? Well, by and large, find? by and large, uh, uh, the, 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 the children, uh, I would say Zoroastrians are as practice, practicing as Christians and Jews mm -hmm. uh, in the general sense. And then you have more Orthodox and less Orthodox. Well, I guess in this kind of and more circumstance, secular. there's always the yeah. possibility of intermarriage and, and things and, like and that. Intermarriage and occurs, mm -hmm. intermarriage occurs, and uh, sometimes the children are Zoroastrian, sometimes they're not. Uh, and, and those things, yes. Can the partner uh, be welcomed into the in Zoroastrian the, in faith? The Zoroast the in, in North America, partners regularly go to fire temples. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not, of, in most cases, not officially, shall we say, baptized as Zoroastrians, uh, but they, they are free to, pr uh, to pray and participate. And, and, and so that's part of the inclusiveness mm -hmm. uh, that one doesn't traditionally see, let's say, in the Indian context, or the, in, in the Iranian context is difficult, of course, because that would not be tolerated by the Islamic regime. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, so it's, uh, so, so the developments, let's say, along the lines even of the, of the Jewish community in the United States. Well, thank you very well, much for telling pleasure. us all thank about that. Thank you for that. inviting me. My thanks to Phi Beta Kappa and to your institute here it's and to uh, you very much for uh, shall we say a great intellectual feast? <laughs> it's been the a last great couple pleasure. of days has been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.